Good evening and welcome. My name is Alice Simon. I'm the member of the Economics Department here at Ohio Wesleyan University, and I have the privilege of being the faculty director of the Walter Mati Center. I would like to welcome everyone from the Delaware community, from the Alumni Association, from the Board of Trustees of the Walter Mati Center, and our students. Welcome and thank you all for being here. Um, tonight's event is sponsored by the Walter Mati Center and is funded by the Heisler Family Endowment for the Study of Business Ethics. The endowment honors graduates James Heisler, the class of 1938, Robert Heisler, the class of 1942, and Bruce Heisler, the class of 1949. James Heisler was born in Ravenna, Ohio, and was the owner of the A.C. Williams Company in Ravenna from 1936 until the late 1970s. During World War II, he worked with the Canadian government in the manufacturing of lightweight aircraft. He was the director of the Second National Bank of Ravenna, and he was on the board of directors with Society Corporation, and in the late 1990s, he endowed an ethics chair at Ohio Wesleyan University, and I have the honor of holding that position. Robert Heisler was also born in Ravenna, Ohio, and he was a star athlete at the high school, as well as here at Ohio Wesleyan. He excelled in golf, and he held the position of executive president of the family business and was inducted in the Wesleyan Athletic Hall of Fame in 1968. Bruce Heisler, was also a scholar athlete while at Ohio Wesleyan. He played football, basketball, baseball, and golf, and he was named an All-Ohio football player three times and won the Bunn Trophy for MVP in the 1948 season. He was an ambulance driver during World War II. He graduated from Wesleyan, he became vice president of the family business, and he also helps us with this endowment. Robert Heisler Jr., James's grandson and Robert's son, if you're following, is fondly known as Yank. And he was not able to be with us this evening, but he sends his regards and best wishes. He's a retired dean of the Kent State University Business School and served as director of the First Energy Corporation. He's also the chief financial officer at Kent State University and chairman and chief executive officer of KeyBank. So we thank the entire Heisler family for their support of events like this right here this evening. Um, on behalf of everyone at the Economics Department and the Walter Mate Center, we again welcome you. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Martin Eisenberg, Wesleyan's Dean of Academic Affairs, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Alice, and after having heard those remarks, I'm delighted to see all of you, and I just want you to know that as you leave the room, there is an exam on the Heisler family. Um, after having just spent dinner with Scott Griffin, uh, I'm really quite excited that he's joining us on campus tonight, and I think this is going to be quite a pleasure. I think he's got some interesting things to say, and will challenge us and provoke our thinking. Um, so you know. Scott Griffin is the Chief Sustainability Officer and Vice President of Communi for Communication of Greif Incorporated. And one of the things that I think is highlighted that connects to this title, one of the things that Greif is known for is Greif was involved in the development of PAC H2O, which is a low cost, durable water backpack, which plays an important role in addressing what's often called the Achilles heel of the Global Clean Water Challenge, which is the human transport of clean water on what's known as the last mile from access points to home in some of the world's least developed countries. In fact, this is actually was honored in 2012 by Popular Science Magazine as one of the best, a best new award in the green category. Um, and I think this speaks to some of the international contributions that Greif has made and its role in the community, but instead of telling you lots more about Greif, since you didn't come to hear me speak, why don't you please join me in giving a warm Obu welcome to Scott Griffin.
Good, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Martin. I appreciate those, those kind words. Um, I'd also like to uh, extend my thanks to the Heiser Family Foundation for funding this uh, important initiative. Alice, thank you for, for all you're doing, making this a world-class uh, event. I appreciate your leadership and your good work. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge all the great students. It's good to see you way, way in the back. That's okay, I understand. You're, uh, I said I'd give $1,000 to the student that sat up front, but no one showed up. Okay. Um, no, that's a, is that an ethical uh, a dilemma? <laughs> All right, I made that up. Um, but I'm, I'm really excited uh, to be here and share with you some of uh, my thoughts on this issue. Um, actually, uh, I started thinking about it when, when I was asked to come in um, to talk about ethics. Um, I uh, report to David Fisher, our chairman, and a um, guy that is... Uh, I think one of the best at this, and, and uh, I've learned a lot from Mr. Fisher about how do you operate as an executive uh, in today's very difficult climate uh, in an ethical manner. So what you're going to see here is a little Scott Griffin and a lot of Greif um, in how we approach things. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to share you, with you some of the things we do well. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about some of the things uh, we don't do so well. Uh, the reality is, uh, in the application of ethics in, in the business world, uh, it's hard, it's messy, it's sometimes uh, ugly, and we don't always get it right. Um, so I'm going to hopefully share with you a series of stories, uh, things that I faced in the last uh, three years. And we're going to go through those stories, and we're going to step back, and I'm going to tell you how we approach them. And I'll let you guys uh, be the judge of whether we did it right or whether we did it wrong. Um, before we jump into the heart of this, uh, I also want to acknowledge um, that some of your students here have inspired me to think about issues about world challenges. I don't know if they're in the audience today, but Valentina, Maddie, Erica, students from your university that are doing great work. Uh, tackling some of these challenges that we look at from a, go a global perspective. And um, quite frankly, I have the good fortune of working with students all over the world. Uh, we have deep working relationships with universities like Oxford in England and Harvard uh, in Boston, but I'm honest, um, say we've got the best right here in Delaware. So it's, uh, it's great to work with you guys. So let's get into this. Um, Let's uh, talk a little bit about Greif, set the context, and then uh, uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, the market in which we're operating. Um, you guys may or may not know this. Greif is a major corporation located a few miles from here. Um, we're the world's largest industrial shipping container manufacturer, kind of landlocked in central Ohio. We're, on paper, we're about $4.5 billion, but we have uh, a number of uh, partnerships around the world in Saudi and uh, other places that actually, actually make us a little larger than that. Um, we have four core businesses that we operate, um, industrial shipping containers, rigid side, flexible industrial shipping containers, timber, and uh, we have a paper business. You may not know this, but uh, we're actually... Uh, recognized on a fairly regular basis as one of the most trustworthy and ethical companies in the United States. Um, the most recent uh, Forbes, which uh, they haven't issued the 2015 yet, but the, in the 2014 we were listed as, uh, as one of the top 100 uh, trustworthy firms. And again, I think that really goes back to um, how the company operates, it's our culture, um, Gary Martz, our chief legal counsel, certainly gets a lot of credit with how he institutionalized these concepts of ethical behavior into the organization. But in its uh, true form, it really takes its, uh, manifests itself in how all of our employees around the world operate. And I think that's why we get uh, this kind of recognition. Um, you may not know us, but you certainly know our customers. Uh, these are the customers that we do business with, Dow, BASF, Asahi, Marabini. You know, we're a global company, uh, 16,000 employees now, six of our recent acquisitions that we've done roughly, uh, operating in some difficult parts of the world, 52 countries we operate. Um, so we're operating in Ethiopia, Pakistan, uh, Venezuela. Uh, we operate in Russia and the Ukraine. All of these are interesting, and we could, quite frankly, uh, from, a, from a discussion lecture perspective, we could, we could take any of those and break them apart and begin having a conversation about how do you deal with uh, 
uh, how do you approach the issues around Russia and the Ukraine? We've got assets. Uh, we've got a number of assets, I think, four or five in Russia and, and uh, two in the Ukraine. Um, my remarks are going to uh, be somewhat um, taken or stolen. I guess that was the word I was looking for. Can I use that word? Um, I think in academic world, they call it research. In business world, we, we borrow great ideas and implement them. Uh, but I'm going to share with you World Business Council concepts. Greif is a proud member of the World Business Council. Uh, we're one of 200 firms that have been participating uh, within the World Business Council for more than five years. The World Business Council, you can recognize the names. They're large institutions. You're elected into this group. Um, and they hold you to an extremely high standard with regards to how you approach some of these major, major issues uh, around the world. Um, you're going to see a series of slides that uh, came from a World Business Council meeting that just happened in the last month. And I hope um, tonight to give you a little insight to what happens at the executive level of a company. What are we thinking about? What are we discussing? How are decisions being made? You know, what, what happens when the CFO and the CEO and the CSO and the COO all get together and argue about issues associated with doing business in uh, Pakistan? How do you come to a conclusion on what is our obligation with respect to tackling some of these issues around climate? And uh, I'm gonna hopefully uh, frame it in a way that um, uh, provides you a sneak peek um, into the executive ranks, uh, which I have great faith many of you will be participating in uh, within your career. Um, let's face it, the world is uh, rapidly changing. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult world. The pace of change that we see, uh, at least uh, f from my perspective, is doing nothing other than getting um, uh, more, I guess, more volatile. Look at what's happening in oil. Uh, look at what's happening with respect to foreign exchange. And in a very rapidly changing environment, um, things that executives fall back on when they need to make the right decision is what I would call your ethical or moral operating system. How do you look at these challenges? You know, I grew up in an era that was largely stable. You know, I'm pretty blessed. Uh, when I entered the workforce, I, wor I entered uh, working for Dow Chemical, and they offered me an international assignment right out of the chute. I went to school right down the road at Ohio State, and uh, my international assignment was to work uh, in Canada. <laughs> Think about that. That was what they called uh, an international assignment. But the world is uh, much more complex. It's uh, volatile. It's changing. Um, in, when you're approaching a world that is, is that volatile from a strategy perspective, you can't fall back on the way you did things in the past. They don't always work. It's an interesting paradox, um, in, particularly when you look at this issue of strategy. Is uh, Most of the frameworks that are taught in university and applied in the business world are based on the way the world looked when the United States, Western Europe, and Japan ruled. But that's not the case by any means anymore. Matter of fact, uh, I'll share with you some statistics that said the developing economy is much more important with respect to how do you approach um, and participate in those markets. So is a decision that we made 15 years ago when we approached a market in Spain the same way that you would approach a market in say, Pakistan or Egypt? I don't know. Let's talk through that. Let me share with you some of the things uh, that we did and some of the things that we, we looked at uh, going forward. So we all know um, one of the world's mega trends is this issue of uh, population. And at the executive level, we talk about this on a fairly regular basis. How does a firm participate in a world that's growing at such a great rate? may surprise you, but it's something that we think a lot about, and it's something that we talk a lot about. And we look at, I mean, for instance, Greif is a company that's been around 137 years. That's a long time. So how are we going to operate in the next 137 years? What's our business model look like? What's our code of ethics look like? What's our moral operating system? 
Do I, do I even have a responsibility as an executive to have a moral operating system? How does a corporation approach these ethical issues? Do we, do we have a responsibility? And exactly what is it? And how do we go about making those decisions? One thing's for sure, though. These megatrends that you guys know probably better than me are changing the way we will operate in the coming years. If you look at population growth and how it's changed, you can see that essentially the triad, which is how we framed up strategic business decisions, the population is quite flat. That's the dark blue in that line. That's the Western Europe, United States, and Japan. There's a great book, if you want to read a good book about what happens when there's no growth. Um, it's called What to Expect When Nobody's Expecting. What types of challenges are there in society? And you know, one of the things I'll say, a universal truth about doing business and that's the, that's the way I have to approach this. I, I, can't, I have to approach ethics from a business perspective is that uh, one thing's for sure is a business cannot thrive in a society that's failing. It just doesn't work. It doesn't work. So you see a tremendous growth in the developing economy. It's called the de-economy. How much do you students know about the de-economy? Do you guys know that the de-economy is the only economy that grew through the Great Recession? Uh, let me see a show of hands uh, back there in the student section. Uh, do you guys uh, think the developing economy is the largest economy in the world? The second largest? The third largest? Or the tenth largest? Raise your hand if you think it's the first largest, it's the largest economy. Okay, we got one. How about second? Raise your hand high. How about 10th? It's the second largest economy in the world, the developing economy. The economy in Tanzania, Rwanda, Kenya, Guatemala. These are very, very, very important markets, and they challenge the way you frame up uh, some of your decision making. So let's look at some of these numbers. I love numbers. Um, in 1900, the world population was 1.6 billion. Um, you fast forward 100 years, it, the numbers flipped to 6.1 billion. Now let's take that number apart a little bit. Let's look at it um, maybe a little more granular to kind of figure out exactly what's going on. If you uh, take and break the population of the triad into age and size from birth to 80 plus, and distribute them out, you get what's called a weak base. It's essentially a society where there are fewer producers than there's those that have what are called entitlements and expectations. It presents a whole bunch of issues associated with how do you deal with um, foreign direct investment. How do you deal with foreign aid if your society is requiring, if the developed economy society is requiring more entitlements just to support uh, the aging population? Let's look at what it looks like for the uh, developing economy. Same scale, same age breakout. You can see it's completely, completely different. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that what happens in a society like Egypt, where over 60% of the young adults that have graduate degrees have never had a job because there's no business development there? How stable is that? What happens in Turkey, where Greif has a massive investment there? And what is my role with respect? Do I have an ethical obligation to engage in solving some of these societal problems? Do I have a role? Is my obligation to the shareholder? Is my obligation to what? How do we approach it? How do we tackle some of these very difficult tasks? Another mega trend that's very fascinating is this issue of migration and urbanization. You've all heard about this. Is, is there's a massive migration occurring within the world. We see essentially more urbanization in our era than we have ever seen. It's interesting because in the past, if you look at periods of great migration, what happens? 
migrations generally occurred from one nation to the next, from east to west, across the great oceans, populizing great countries and building great societies. Unfortunately, sovereign nations are not allowing this migration to occur. And what happens is you often see a tremendous amount of concentration uh, within large urban centers, and you have a tremendous amount of challenges, like in Nairobi. We're, we're working on a project with Harvard in Rwanda. Has anybody been to Rwanda? Rwanda is a beautiful place that's emerged from a very horrific experience. But the project that we've got going on in, in Rwanda is how do you take community health to the most far reaches of society? How do you take community health to the poorest parts of Rwanda? And why would you do that? Why, why would you want to do that? Why would President Kagame want to do that? Why is he so passionate about it? We've got to take health care to the farthest reaches. We can't just build capacity, health care capacity in Nairobi. And why is Harvard and Partners in Health so passionate about it? Well, one of the reasons is that if you look at the most vulnerable people that migrate to the urban center in order to get uh, medical treatment, who is it? Anybody? Women and girls. And they arrive at these cities and they're exploited. The opportunities aren't present. And a whole bunch of problems occurred. Does Greif have an obligation to participate in the creation of these centers in Rwanda? Do I have a role? How do we engage and participate in this, this challenge? How do we prevent the exploitation and the sex trafficking and human trafficking of girls and women in the developing economy? These are ethical questions that corporations have to tackle. They're uncomfortable, they're messy, they're ugly. You know, and, and I don't know if necessarily we're all getting them right, but at this issue of urbanization and my Migration is a very important topic for us to engage in and tackle. So if you look at essentially um, this issue of population, if you look at this issue of uh, how do these economies necessarily need to develop, in 2009 you look at the gross domestic product of, uh, of the U.S., Japan, kind of what we call the, uh, uh, I think it's called the G7, um, and you can see it in relation to what's called the E7, which is the developing side. It's, uh, it's quite, uh, quite interesting. And look what needs to happen by 2050. And again, this is information that is presented to the World Business Council. The World Business Council pays a ton of money to have the best economists, the best scientists to come in and present this information. And the only people in the room that are hearing this are the CEOs and the liaison delegates for those firms that are listed there. So the question is, how, how, do we, how do we deal with this is if this is what the, uh, uh, the world is, is going to look like? And this is a good case. This is a best case scenario. This means that there's commerce, jobs, stability uh, within those economies that we were, uh, we were looking at. So if you look and fast forward just you know, 15 years from now, which will be kind of when you guys out there, you students, are gonna be kind of in the heart of your careers, you can see we've gotta figure out how to operate in an environment where we need 50% more energy, we need 40% more water, and we need 35% more food. Significant, significant challenges. How do you deal with issues of scarcity? How do you deal with issues of inequality? Um, and a company of our size and a company of our, like us that have been around so long, again, it goes back to do we have a, uh, a responsibility, an obligation to in, engage in this? This is an eye chart, and those of you in the back are really going to struggle uh, to see this, but this is the money chart, if there ever was a money chart, that's produced by the World Business Council. I'll just describe it. There's two axes. The one on the bottom is an axis that looks, axis that looks at the uh, United Nations Human Development Index. And essentially it says that those little circles are countries. Those yellow countries are African countries. If you are a country that is to the left of that blue line, 
Got the left and right, I think, right? Left of the blue line. Based on United Nations designation, you are operating in an unsustainable society, meaning you haven't properly addressed issues of mobility. You have not appropriately addressed issues of uh, security. You have not addressed necessary human rights. And you can see that we have a tremendous number of countries that are operating to the left. The other axis looks at what's called the ecological footprint of the uh, population within each of those countries. And if you go from the bottom to the top, essentially you're making a greater ecological impact. What's interesting about that is that red line that runs across there is what the best scientists say is where we need to be as a society to operate in a sustainable environment by 2050. Now, what's interesting about that is you can see the United States. We're the big red dot, all right? We're operating in an environment where we're consuming as a society a disproportionate amount of the world's resources. We know that. It's not debated or discussed. We don't argue about it. It's a reality. So the question is, is, is essentially as you move countries from the left to the right, which is a necessary action, how do you do that without taking them up out of that box? And you can see, I'll provide these slides to you, you can see, unfortunately, that we haven't figured it out. We have, we have not figured out how to introduce innovation or technology. We haven't tackled this issue of um, responsible consumption. And the net result is, even in the United States, even with a lot of good effort, we're still unfortunately moving uh, in the wrong direction. So you're presented with this information. Each and every one of us is presented with this information. I'm interested in the application of ethical frameworks. What is our moral operating system? How do we approach this? You know, how do we collectively tackle this? Because we certainly have enough intellect uh, available. I absolutely have great confidence that we have the knowledge and the ideas, but we just haven't put 100% of our resources uh, behind it. So let's talk a little bit about, so I, I talked to you a little bit about Greif. I talked to you a little bit about the operating environment that we're in. So let's talk a, a little bit about um, ethical operating systems, kind of how I approach it. And I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get uh, somewhat personal here, so, so bear with me. Uh, so, um, great picture, looks like spring break, beautiful, uh, uh, beautiful beach. Uh, that photo, uh, was taken March 11th, 2011 on an island in the Pacific Ocean. Does anybody remember what happened March 11th, 2011? Tsunami. Yep, exactly right. So a magnitude 9 earthquake occurred 80 miles off the Japanese coast, resulting in horrific damage that we're all familiar with, the nuclear issues, and also devastated a number of islands out in the Pacific. This was taken uh, before the tsunami got there. Gordon Brown, anybody remember Gordon Brown? Some of you remember Gordon Brown? He was uh, the Prime Minister of Great Britain from 2011, 2007 to 2011. He was uh, largely credited with this idea of a global ethical code. That, that during the economic crisis, he, he used, I can't, I don't necessarily know if I should give him credit, but I'm just giving you from my work, from my knowledge and reading, he talked a lot about global ethics. And some, I remember uh, uh, listening to a talk where somebody asked uh, Gordon uh, the question, and the question was, if you were standing on this beach, looking out knowing a tsunami was coming and you only had time to run one direction to warn the people and to the right there were two Britons and to the left there were 10 Kenyans. Which direction would you go? You could only go one way. How do you answer that? Now I got just done talking to you about we've got a tsunami approaching us. We got massive issues 
okay? Big challenges. We're standing on that beach looking out. You know, you could frame that question many ways, right? I could say I've got, I've got developing economies on the left and I've got shareholders on the right. So I want you to strike that from the video thing. Um, but you, you're faced with those kinds of decisions, right? How do you, how do you, how do, you know, just reflect on that for a moment. What, do you, what direction you go? Um, and the definition of global ethics, um, this is a largely quote from Gordon. Um, do we believe that the life of every human on the planet is worth the same, equal consideration regardless of nationality, race, religion, gender, or age? How do you answer that question? Now, the way I've approached it is uh, I've been very fortunate in my life to have great mentors. I've had blessed experiences. I have deep faith. I've got a beautiful bride that supports me. Um, and I've never gotten far away from study. I've never walked away. I still teach. One of the reasons why I still teach graduate classes at OSU is because it forces me to be um, up to speed and look at these issues and try to stay current. Um, and, and I've always asked myself, okay, well, what is my um, moral or ethical operating system? How do I answer the question? Um, if you look at uh, Plato, and I'm not an expert, so there's some ethical folks, so I'm going to really make this bad, but if I understand what he was saying, he said ethics is like math. Um, it's an absolute. You can, you can find, it, find the answer with a formula. So if you approach it as kind of he's defined it, the way I look at it is, okay, which is the bigger number, two or ten? Which way do you turn? Well, that's easy based on that way you look at it. But that wasn't how Gordon answered the question. Gordon Brown answered it a different way. If you look at what Aristotle said, it says, making the decision in the here and now and using our best judgment to find the proper path. Gordon seemed to more err on that, and he fell back on that I'm obligated as the Prime Minister of Great Britain to protect the interest of my constituents, which are my, the Britons. So he said, I unfortunately have to run uh, that direction. I didn't like either of those answers, quite frankly. Um, and there's, a, there's someone that I've read a lot of, and it's a guy by the name of Gant, and it could be a lady, so I apologize for that. Um, but um, I, I've used kind of this as a way to frame things up. It says, use reason to establish rules to guide our conduct. Then it is our duty to follow the rules. And what I want to talk about in this next section is this idea of following the rules. I, I would frame it, how many of you are snow skiers? Anybody use snow skiers? couple of you out there? Okay. Well, I, I learned how to ski many years ago, and one of the universal truths of skiing is you look really good on the easy slopes, but as they get progressively more difficult, your form and your technique really show up. And if you get on a black diamond and you don't have good form and technique and you haven't practiced, you're going to wipe out. And I look at that with respect to ethics, is that in the heat of the moment, when things are very, very difficult, complex and challenging, fast and furious, it's hard to make the right call. It's easy for us to sit out here and say what's right and what's wrong, which is essentially what ethics is all about. But what happens when you're really, really faced with some difficult challenges? And I think making those decisions, if you guys in the back walk away with anything, I would say walk away with this, is that what you do in your work life matters. There's a guy by the name of Thomas Merton. If you haven't been exposed to Thomas Merton, please read what he has to say. He was someone that converted to, uh, became a Tapas monk later in his career after being successful in other things. And Thomas Merton said, essentially in essence, um, talked about discernment and this idea that you really have to think about how you go about your work life. That when you go to work and you make decisions, you're responsible for those decisions. So if you're asked at work to downsize individuals from your firm and you follow that path, I believe that if you haven't gone to great lengths to look at every other opportunity to do something different, you're going to be accountable 
for that decision. Whenever you try to cross through whatever pearly gate or whatever you guys want to call it, you don't get a hall pass. You don't go to wherever you're going and saying, well, I had to make a business decision. It doesn't work that way, at least as I see it, and at least as Tom and Mer Thomas Merton has kind of framed it up. These decisions are important. Indecision is important. Doing nothing is as much of a sin as, or more of a sin than, than making the wrong call. So let me give you some examples of things I've faced. Let's start with Haiti. Um, so uh, January 12, 2010, a, magnify, a magnitude 7 earthquake strikes the island 16 miles uh, west of Port-au-Prince, 160,000 deaths. I've heard numbers as much as 350. I think the, I'm using the one that's quoted by the US. Uh, some of you in the audience have been to Haiti. You know that it still hasn't recovered. There's still major issues there. Um, we were asked by uh, the State Department and the Clinton Foundation to come in and do some work there right after the earthquake. They called us in. They knew that we're one of the world's largest movers of steel. And they said, can you help us get steel to the island? We need to get the steel in. Uh, so we, we actually diverted steel from Latin America into the island. It helped keep some industry moving forward. Another project they asked us to do is they said, hey, you guys have a school there, um, and we want you to go in and work with our partners to try to bring the school up and also address clean water. Can you do this? So the, we, uh, we got a group together, assembled a group of folks that went there, including my um, chairman, David Fisher. And uh, I have, again, um, I, I, I really admire the guy because he went to Haiti at a time where we were under tremendous duress. Uh, dealing with some organizational issues, and he still went. I'm going to basically make a long story short and say that everything worked except one thing. Uh, the Haitian government wouldn't release um, uh, what we called a Z-weed filtration system that was absolutely mission critical uh, for us to do the work that we needed to ensure the children had clean water. And the Haitian government said, listen, um, he goes, in order to you get this, get this through customs, um, we need you to pay uh, a fee. They called it a hundred different things. I heard it like five different ways. They called it an expediter fee, a facilitator fee, a storage fee. I don't care what they called it. But I wasn't going to pay it because I knew it was a bribe. And I knew that that wasn't the right thing to do for the long term for uh, the company. But I knew we were really in a difficult situation because it was right there, I could almost see it, and I needed it to get it over. So I agreed to meet with the uh, Haitian government, and they threw a beautiful party 10 days after uh, the earthquake in a restaurant. And they brought their senior leadership together, and they positioned it as a thank you to Greif for the work we did on some of the, in some of the steel and some of these other areas. And, um, and um, one of the th things was the uh, minister of, uh, can't remember, economics, we'll call him, uh, nice man, very nice man. He handed me an envelope, and he said, this is all you need. We're going to get this out tomorrow, and all you need to do is sign this paper. Well, I mean, I knew that was an interesting dilemma I was in. So I stood up, walked outside, stood by the pool, opened it up, and it said that I had a Everything was fine. I just needed to sign this paperwork, but I had to pay a $10,000 demerge fee, which was about what these other things were, but it was just called something different. And I stood there for a moment, and I thought about the kids. I thought about the earthquake. I thought about the dilemma. I thought about all the challenges. And right then, a tremor hit. I don't know if you guys have ever been in a tremor, but it was a four-point something. And the earth just shook like crazy. It was like a wave. And I remember looking up, seeing things move and that shouldn't be moving and trees going the wrong direction. And I was by a pool and the big wave going. And I turned around and I walked back in the restaurant and everybody was gone. They ran out of there faster than they could because they had no idea uh, what was happening. So let's go to story number two. Ecosystems, grand science of the future. It's essentially what it does is it look at, looks at what is your ecological impact of the products that you manufacture. Every large, great company that I know has been working on this for decades. 
Google made it popular by actually assigning costs associated with uh, ecosystem costs. So Greif embarked on this uh, journey. We started in Europe about eight years ago, and the original question was, we believe that steel drums are better than plastic drums, and we'd like to market a campaign about the ecological benefits of a steel drum. So we, we engaged uh, Heidelberg Institute out of Germany. We began doing the study. When you look at ecological impact of your product, you have to look across a whole set of essentially uh, elements. Climate change is the one that you guys know in the United States. But the reality is, in the rest of the world, they're way beyond climate. They're looking at other issues, uh, things like human toxicity. And the question is, how do you look at the ecological impact of your product across all of those dimensions? In addition, you have to look at it from the context of your supply chain, from cradle to grave. So you marketing, logistics folks, you guys all know this stuff is really what is the impact of your product from extraction to its final, whether you recycle it or how you, whether you landfill it. It's a grand science. There's a lot of information, a lot of work that goes into this. Greif knows the ecological impact of nearly every single product we make. We certainly know that of every the major category. And we look at this prior to making any major investment also. So we did the study, and again, another eye chart, and essentially you get these spider web charts, and it says, okay, what is the ecological impact of steel drums versus plastic drums? And you guys don't need to get into the science or the details of this, but what it showed was actually steel drums have an advantage, but not always. There are some elements where plastic is better than steel on issues of climate on issues of human toxicity. So we're faced with a dilemma. The commercial organization in Europe really was interested in marketing the advantages of steel over plastic. The science says there is some advantage. But full disclosure says not always. Sometimes plastic is better. And you know, we found something interesting, even more interesting about it, is when you look at the life cycle impact, the single greatest thing Greif could do to reduce the ecological impact of our product is to maintain the useful life of the product. Well, that's a dilemma. I make money by selling things one at a time. And the research is saying that the best thing I can do is maintain the useful life. And that's the, look at the difference. 66% environmental benefit by increasing the use of the product by one turn, using it one more, I couldn't do anything else. I couldn't light gauge it. I couldn't make my trucks run on lower costs or lower impact fuel. The model was redesign the way I go to market. Okay, I, I entered into this uh, investigation trying to understand steel or plastic. Now I got a real in interesting dilemma. All right, let's look at another one, Turkey. Turkey's a very important uh, market for Greif. And those of you that were looking and were following the news last year, you know that there was a tremendous amount of unrest in Turkey. In February 10th of 2014, Greif's largest manufacturing asset was occupied by a group of political provocateurs. They took our plant hostage 600 employees and management were essentially held hostage by a group of provocateurs. I don't know what you could call them. I'm not going to call them anything other than to say they had a political agenda and they chose to use Greif. You guys were probably seeing this on the news as water cannons in the uh, square. I was living it out real life because they had chose to use Greif's largest industrial facility as an area to demonstrate. Now, why did they pick Greif? Well, one is, our lo any of you have been to Bar or, or, um, Istanbul, you can't miss our facility. We have the largest wind turbine you can see when you cross the bridge. We also have a massive parking lot. That wind turbine in that parking lot became a beacon for demonstrators. They were like, meet at the Greif plant where the parking lot in the uh, windmill is. And it just so happened that they chose to go into our asset. 
So February 10th, April 3rd, they were real popular. Uh, the provocateurs went outside our plant and actually shut down the bridge that goes across uh, the river in Istanbul and for a long period of time protested against, uh, against the company and what we were trying to get done. They were really just making a larger political statement about labor there. In Turkey, um, it's a complicated model, but there's something called the Tesheron model. Generally, you employ a Tesheron, and the Tesheron employs the labor. It's an ugly environment, but it's been around in Turkey for a long time and have kept the wages low. And that's largely why society was uh, rejecting the idea and they were protesting it. So I, I represent the companies. I, I have government um, relations and, and also have corporate communications. So I'm on a, a group called the Crisis Management Communication Line. And we're monitoring this. On April 10th, we get a call that there's 1,500 Turkish police outside our asset, and they wanted approval to go in the facility and reclaim it. And I needed to make that decision. How are we going to do that? What is the position? Do we allow that to occur? Knowing um, what we've seen on CNN and others and actually being there, uh, what that could result in. The police uh, came into the asset, took control of the asset after about eight hours. But unfortunately, a small number of the provocateurs found their way to the top of the building. You can see them there. You can see how high it is. It's a, the building itself is about five stories high. And we get a call. They want to negotiate. And if we don't negotiate with them, they're going to start jumping off this building. They're w willing to be martyrs on behalf of the labor. And the request was, this was about, um, you can see him, the one guy that was standing there, was as it was getting dark and it was starting to rain and the request was, Scott, they want to know if they can come off the roof and if you're willing to give them a room so that they can assemble and meet. You need to make a call. All right, I'm gonna tell you one more story. Greif is the world's largest manufacturer of industrial shipping containers. We're the world's largest manufacturer of jerry cans. We do a lot of work around the world, and one of the things we noticed is that in the poorest parts of the world, a lot of people were reusing and reconstituting industrial containers. Think of it this way. Think of it if you went home into your garage and got a ethylene glycol antifreeze thing, dumped it out, rinsed it out full of water, filled it back up full of water, and took it in and set it on your kitchen table and used it for your friends and family to drink out of. Would we ever do that in a million years? No way. You would, re you would reject that idea, yet this is done around the world on a regular basis. So what is my obligation there? What should we do? How should we address it? We started looking at it, and one of the things we found is that women in particular and children, girls, bear the burden of porting water around the world. They put it on their head and they carry it, and all of that weight puts a real burden on their spine. We also noticed that when you look inside the container, the containers are impossible to contain, uh, to clean, and they often have prior contents, trace comments, trace contents. The um, ethylene glycol or the agrochemical leaches back into the water over time, and it results in poisoning of the, of the family. With the help of um, Battelle Institute, we looked at a deeper look. We actually found that a vast majority of the containers that were used around the world contained waterborne ailments. So not only do you have the potential to leach chemicals, but I think the number was 67% of the containers had waterborne ailments that caused diarrhea and other real stomach ailments. So these women and girls were bringing, they may go get clean water, but they bring home dirty water. So what do I do? What is my responsibility? How do I look at this? Hannah Arnett in the book, The Banality of Evil, said that the most evil that is done in this world is not done by people who choose to be evil. It arises from not thinking. How do I approach these? Do I have an ethical responsibility? 
I'm on, I'm on the beach. I've got all these challenges to the left. I got my shareholders and to the right. What is my responsibility? So let's, uh, let's look at these real quick. Haiti. In Haiti, we chose not to pay the bribe. What we did was we began a process of trucking water to the school, and we paid an extraordinary amount of money, but we shipped water into, our, into the school until our partner, General Electric, was able to bring in the uh, Z-weed filtration from Dominican Republic down. Right call, wrong call. Certainly was prolonged maybe two weeks before we got clean water to the asset. Turkey, what did I do? More importantly, what would you do? How would you approach it? In this case, I said no. We will not negotiate. The good news there is that um, the uh, individuals were apprehended shortly after we said no. And uh, although they were roughed up quite a bit, no one um, ended up getting killed um, in the process. So what did we do about the issue of water? And um, I'm not going to get into the video. I'll give you guys a video. But I'm proud to say that we embarked on a journey to come up with a new way to carry water. And some of your students have taken this product into Haiti. Um, I'm happy to say that it's around the world. It's in over 37 different countries. It's been involved in numerous disasters. It's benefiting well over a million people uh, on an annual basis. And we just received our single largest order from the Saudis. Um, they placed an order for 650,000 backpacks. And where are they going to take the backpacks? They're going to take them to Rwanda to be part of that project, to take clean water to the poorest parts and avoid women having the necessity to travel to clean water. So some principles I want to share with you that work for me. So these are uh, kind of Scott Griffin's view of the world. I said you need an ethical, moral framework, some way to approach things. You need to take responsibility for your work life as the things you do outside. One of the principles is frameworks need to be anchored in trust. Here's the framework that we used to make a decision with regards to the ecosystems. In the ecosystem decision, we were faced with plastic and steel are not always the best solution. It's very dependent. But the right answer is to innovate your business model. I'm happy to say that Greif is now the world's largest reconditioner of industrial containers. We invested over $300 million in a new business model and a new way of doing things. And the only way we would have got there is we've got a code of ethics, we've got great leadership that have understand our responsibilities, and they didn't turn their back on the answer. That's a tremendous investment for Greif to make to be now the world's largest. Uh, some other principles, um, the necessity of strangers. There's a great book um, that I've read many times of the same title. I'm of the opinion that the world is not in a real good spot. Okay, we've got a lot of challenges. I was in India not too long ago, and I was told that in India, a goat is an asset and a girl's a liability. How can that be? Do you know that there, are, for every person, every Every 350 people in India, there's an NGO. So the way I look at it is that a lot of these problems persist because the institutions that really need to weigh into it haven't fully leaned into the problem. Now, I will tell you that I think academics have done a decent job. I think the faith base have done a decent job. I think sovereign nations have done a decent job. I think NGOs have done the best they could do. But I would say the corporation, the corporations, the leadership, who are the corporations? Me. We have not done our fair share to lean into these great ethical issues. The whole construct of corporations have only been around for like 300 years. Faith-based institutions have been around forever. 
So we're a relatively new concept, this whole idea of aggregation of asset disaggregation of liability. But I believe that corporations can lean into So what does this have to do with strangers? The reality is I've got to figure out how to work with people I have nothing in common with other than a belief and a mission and a desire to tackle the great problems of the world. I have got to figure out how to work with Ohio Wesleyan. I've got to figure out how to work with the Catholics. I've got to figure out how to work with sovereign nations. I, as a corporation, I know if I try to tackle this alone, I'll never get it right. I need people to stand beside me that normally I would have nothing else in common with other than the importance of tackling some of these things. So what's the rule of six? I had a great mentor from Cuba, and he said, Scott, you gotta surround yourself with six great people. He goes, it's extremely important that you do that. And the reason is, is because basically when you make a decision or you face a difficult decision, you want these six people that really care about you to give you advice. There's a young lady that turned down a job. Now that job, that decision is a difficult decision. But I will tell you the decisions going forward get more complex, they get more difficult. If you surround yourself with six people that care about you when you approach that, they'll provide good counsel. The other thing I use this group of six to is I ask them, I ask them. I said no in Turkey. I was worried they could have jumped. Did I make the right call? I want you to tell me. I'm in full disclosure. I'm going to give you everything I know. But I want you to give me advice. Pedro Martinez Fonts, before he passed away, said, Scott, you know why six is important? He said, no, Pedro, I don't know, but I've been using this rule forever. He goes, because it takes six people to carry your casket. Why wait? They can hold you up throughout life. Don't wait. So I, I've used that a lot, and I think it's good in business. You make decisions, you work with people you trust, talk about it. Did I make the right call? So as we kind of uh, bring this uh, to a close, I would say that we've got to kind of reframe the way we approach things, look at things differently. Don't use old frameworks that were based on the triad, the old way that we uh, analyze things. Make decisions about complete strangers that you've never met, and oh, by the way, some of them have never been born. But you owe it. What are we doing about sustainable consumption? What are we doing about climate? What are we doing about food scarcity? Nothing. Well, we're going to be held accountable for nothing. I guarantee you. In closing, I would encourage each of you to reframe the way you look at the world. It's rapidly changing. You need your moral compass. You need your moral and ethical operating system. But we need to look at things differently. When I was growing up and I looked at that, what did I see? Poverty, the necessity of philanthropy, problems, issues. But how do I look at that today? If you look a little closer, that's the new market. There's a restaurant there, there's a DIY store, there's some shipping containers in that frame. I gotta completely look at it differently reframe the way we look at things. We talked a lot about water in the backpack. I'm gonna tell you in closing one last story. In Rwanda, we were taken to a water source and we had the opportunity to discuss the backpack. The little girl in the middle uh, was given a backpack. We have kids packs and she put it on her back and her mom and everyone there was so proud of this girl. She stood up real straight, showed everybody that she could handle all of that weight. And if any of those of you that have been to Rwanda know it's a country of hills. And we were at a school and the water source was just right outside the school. So all the students were there, some community health workers, and we were with Harvard. PIH, Paul Farmer was there. Do you know Paul Farmer? Some of you do, he's a future Nobel Peace Prize winner, amazing man. Anyways, this little girl took off running, and she ran down into the school. She ran up around, just running as fast as she could. I took a bunch of photos, actually was just inspired by the fact of what I was seeing. And um, when we were heading back up 
to uh, where we started, I was talking to the community health worker and I said, wow, I go, that's amazing. Everyone was clapping and so excited, particularly the women. And I said, it must be because it's so easy for this little girl to carry this water. And he said, no. He goes, these little girls are raped on the way home because they're afraid to put down the water because they know how important that water is and they know if they drop it, they gotta go back and get some later that night. So they don't wanna do it. And it wasn't an issue of a burden, it was an issue of security that they were so excited about. I was completely missing the whole, the whole benefit to it. I was not, you know, I just, I just didn't understand. I didn't, it was difficult for me to, to really frame it up. So I would encourage you to reframe how you view the world. I would encourage you to open your aperture, step back, walk around it. And when you're on that beach, use all of those experiences. Use your ethical uh, operating system. Use the people around you because these decisions are difficult, they're complex, and particularly when it gets, when it gets uh, challenging. You need all of that to make the right call. So it's been a blessing to be part of the night. I encourage you guys to uh, go do great things. We need you. And uh, I thank you for listening to me for the last, I don't know how long. Hope it's not too long. Thank you. Scott has agreed to take a few questions. Um, if you have a few questions, raise your hand and someone with a microphone will come to you. You have to ask one. Back there. Hi. So I was wondering, like, so I, I uh, heard that you actually made a new business out of refurnishing old containers. And overall, that actually added value to your company. Do you believe that most sustainability projects actually are beneficial to both the world community as well as to uh, shareholders? Yes. Unequivocally, yes. I, if you look at the great institutions, great companies, for, I'll give you an example. We're involved with BASF, the world's largest chemical company. So as I progress through my, it's a great question, as I progress through my career, we, uh, businesses used to look at things by product value, and then they shifted in the 80s and 90s and looked at market value. BASF is lining its whole business models around solving three great problems. They're putting the full bandwidth and capability of their institution on not, it's not a market metric or a product metric, it's in the, the, one of the ones that we're working with them on is uh, um, uh, food loss is because there's a tremendous benefit to reduce the amount of food that is lost. I think I, think I read 40% of all food is lost from the field to the fork in the world. If you could cut that down, you got benefits on water, energy, you solve some of these hunger issues. So, and BASF, smart company. They're, they're putting their whole, whole capabilities against it. Good question. I'm inspired by the students asking questions. Isn't that awesome? Give them a hand, come on. Do you believe that the, the legal structure of corporations um, has an impact um, in preventing uh, companies to act responsibly? So in terms of um, being committed to shareholder value rather than, uh, and, and so some of the uh, limitations that poses for um, executives? Uh, yes, but they're rapidly being brought down. So I, I, it'd be naive for me to say no, um, but I, I think uh, going forward, these barriers are being addressed by smart people. How about the adults? Any questions? So do you see that the corporate world is doing less um, Planned obsolescence, you know, with all your big appliances, they're planned to die within 10 years. I can't answer that. I would think that planned obsolescence is, is an issue, but I would say that um, businesses are emerging uh, to deal with planned obsolescence 
If you look at what the Chinese do, the Chinese are essentially taking all of the cardboard and steel or plastic that would come from products that are obsolete and they're turning them into products that then they turn around and sell to us. So I, uh, I think um, if the company that is dealing with planned obsolescence, cell phones is an example, uh, where that's a major, major issue, um, I think you'll see markets emerge to deal with that, and I think you'll also see a few real smart companies figure out how to um, avoid such rapid obsolescence. How can our college students get best prepared for the career ahead of them? Oh, wow. Uh, well, it, I would say, um, I would answer it this way. At an institution as great as Ohio Wesleyan, it's hard to really fully take advantage of everything this institution has to offer. I think students often just look at the um, education piece an institution offers, but there's a whole nother world called research and uh, the application of your knowledge. And to get fully prepared, I think you really have to divide your time here into one third in the classroom, one third of kind of getting to know what the faculty are researching and writing about and participate in that process. Because uh, I think that's an important skill to develop in one third. Um, do this, uh, I heard a lot about it over dinner, this whole idea of getting out and about in the world and applying some of this. Um, I'll give you another thing I would say is that um, there's a big difference between what I see at um, Ohio State and what I see at MIT. I'll use that as an example. Or Ohio State in Oxford. And at the, so Oxford and MIT, um, they spend a tremendous amount of time working with the students to find their path to a career. And the reality is that in order for you to get a good job, if you're a junior, you ought to be spending about 10 hours a week trying to figure out how to do that. That includes networking, sending, or participating in things like this. Um, and as you get into your senior year, unfortunately, that number even goes up. So I would ask, ask yourself the question, you know, how much of your time is put into getting a good career? Because that's why you're here. Um, and if it isn't a substantial amount of time, you're going to get beat by institutions like uh, that I mentioned, where their students are spending a tremendous amount of time. They're they're working it into their planner. They're they're held accountable for demonstrating that they're moving forward. Having said that, you are in a wonderful place. Uh, you are going to be very well prepared. Uh, students that come out of this institution are exceptional. I mentioned three of them that I had work with, and they are the they are amazing. So, hope I answered that. All right, we're done. I want to let you guys go. Thank you.